said, do you have the internet? And they say, yes. So I said, hey, our sermons, our services are on the internet. Uh, you can log in and watch uh, a sermon there. And they said they planned on doing that. So praise the Lord for that. And anybody that you need to stay home because of sickness, you don't have to miss worship. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was sick on a Wednesday night. And I lay in flat in bed. But you know what I could do? I could log on to the live stream of a friend of mine's service. And I was greatly blessed by that. And uh, so, you know, just because you're homesick doesn't mean you have to miss worship, right? right. Uh, there's plenty of worship opportunities for the child of God that wants to worship. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, people ask about, you know, are we going to close our church? Uh, you know what? God in his infinite wisdom has decided to keep us under 250 people. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? And our auditorium is so large, you can have as much space as you want between people. Um, and, uh, and that's a wonderful thing. Uh, we are going to have church, okay? Amen. If you're sick, stay home. If you're worried, stay home. But we're going to have service. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we've had Wednesday night service and there's only 10 of us here, but we still had Wednesday night service. Yeah. Uh, the numbers do not matter to me. God's people who are able to come should be fed. Amen. If they're not able to come, that's, I respect that. And we'll pray that for them if they're not able to come. But those who are able to come and want to come will be coming. Okay? Amen? So that's the plan. Now, I am being prudent and practical. Some of you saw me walking around and I wiped off every doorknob in every one of these buildings were wiped off this morning before service. And uh, before this evening service, guess what's going to happen again? Every doorknob is going to be wiped off with a, a Clorox wipe. Now, that's a good habit in flu season period, right? Uh, my wife is wiping stuff down in our house all over the place. But she doesn't want to get sick. She has a very weak immune system and she does not want to get sick. And I don't blame her. And so we want to be practical, prudent, and prayerful. But not panicking, right? We don't want to be panicking. Bre they, yes, sir. That is true. That is true. That is true. They are headed home. Pray for their safety. Thanks for reminding me of that. Sister Sharon and Christy drove down uh, early yesterday morning and got into Lancaster last evening, loaded up Jonathan and Micah's stuff and Jonathan's fiance and her sister's stuff, and they are headed back right now and should be in church this evening if they're awake. <laughs> but, um, but anyways, pray for their safety as they journey home. This morning and tonight, we're going to be in Luke chapter 5. And this morning, we're going to look at the first 11 verses. And this evening, we're going to look at the next two events in this passage. And I'd love for you to be here tonight. Uh, I'm going to address specifically the whole coronavirus thing. You know, we sang this, this just a little while ago, Jesus paid it all. Right. And in that second verse, I think it's the second verse, it talks about that Jesus is able to change the leper's spots. Amen. That's not talking, that if you check the spelling there, that's not talking about the fast animal that lives in Africa. Okay? That's not the spots it's talking about. It's talking about the disease, leprosy. Yeah, right? right? Yeah. That's in Luke chapter 5. We're going to look at that tonight. Yeah. God is superior to any disease. Amen. Right? Amen. And God does not need a disease to take me home to heaven. Right. Now he can use that if he wants to. I am not worried about it because I'm going to heaven. Amen. 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 We need to face life with faith, not fear. There you go. Right? And, and this pa these passages in Luke 5 are all about faith building. And we're going to look at that this morning and tonight. Building our faith. We're looking at our theme is rooted in Christ and our faith needs to be founded on Christ. Our faith needs to be rooted in Christ. Our faith needs to be built up in Christ. It's all about Jesus, amen? amen. And we're going to look at that this morning and tonight. So Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. 
that God's word says, and it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake. But the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. So this is a morning and they've been fishing all night long. And later on in the text it makes that statement. So after they were fishing, uh, they, they cleaned their nets in the water. And uh, just to get, you know, seaweed, fish gunk. They didn't have fish gunk because they didn't catch anything. But it's just normal practice to wash their nets and then lay them out and dry them. And then they were ready to go for the next time they went out fishing. And so they're doing that. And the Bible goes on and it says... And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him, or he asked him. He would thrust out uh, a little uh, from the land, and he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now, notice in verse 1, it says, he, it, he was there by the, the sea, the lake, and the people were pressing upon him. Why were they pressing upon him? To hear the word. They weren't, these people were not looking for just a miracle. They were wanting to hear the word. Amen. Okay? So that's why he asked Peter, Simon, to push out from the water. So all these people standing on the seashore could hear him because sound travels well over water. Yes. Right? You can have somebody 100 yards from you on land and have a hard time hearing them holler at you put them a hundred waters across water, you got no problem hearing them. Yeah. In fact, I've been on land overhearing somebody in a boat and I hear, they're just talking. And I can hear what they're saying and some of it I didn't want to hear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where are voice sound waves travel better over water? And so Jesus wanted all these people to hear him and so he does this and it worked out well. And the Bible goes on, verse 4. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep, let down your... What does it say? Say it with me. Yeah. Plural, correct? Yeah. Very important. It's very important when you read the Bible, pay attention to words. Yeah. Don't, don't miss the details when you're reading the Bible. Yeah. Words are significant. Amen? Punctuation is actually significant. Okay? So we got to pay attention when we're reading. So we've got plural nets. Notice what he says. 4A, say it with me. Draught. That means a very large haul of fish or whatever you're doing. It's, you're, it's a lot of whatever you're looking for. Okay? So he told them, he gave them a command, let down your Per, that's correct, plural. And he promised them, he gave them a can, command and a promise. He says, the reason I'm telling you to let down your nets is because for a draught. I am promising you, you will get a bunch of fish if you let down a bunch of nets. That's basically what he's saying. So here goes Peter sticking his foot in his mouth again. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night. Peter and his friends are going to learn something new about Jesus. When Jesus speaks, he knows what he's talking about. When Jesus gives a promise, he can back it up. Amen? And Jesus knows more about what we're doing than we know about what we're doing. So here's Peter saying, Lord, uh, I know you're new around here, but... Um, uh, yeah, I know this fishing thing's not really your deal, but let me, let me clue you in on a few things about fishing, okay? First of all, you do your fishing early. Uh, Frank Bickle does believe in that. He is probably usually the first one out there. He likes to go early, all right? And typically, my, you know, my brother was the same way. Uh, we went, when we'd go fishing, it was sun up. We were there. And uh, early, because, and they do bite better early and late, not in the middle, okay? And this fishing, they actually did better at night. Uh, when we were up in Alaska, uh, there's a lot of times they don't even let people out to fish until after midnight. And so they would actually get their eight hours of fishing in 
you know, before the day started, they were going home to go to bed after they took care of selling their fish and all of that. But, uh, but you know, a lot of places, that's when you do it, at night. Other places, it's better other times. Here, in this time of the year, the fishing was better at night. And Peter says, God, Lord, we've already fished the best time. <laughs> and we didn't catch anything. Obviously, a bad day. Okay? And fishing, you know, fish are fickle, aren't they? Fish are fickle. I mean, barometric pressure does have to do with fishing. Uh, and, but not always, because you can go out on a rotten day weather-wise, and you can kill them, you know, slay them fishing. But usually, when the barometric pressure's down, the fishing's not as good, typically. But hey, you know what? You got to go out and try it to find out, make sure, right? But, but the point is, Peter said, we fished the best time and we caught nothing. And notice what he says, nevertheless, it's kind of a caveat, since you said it, Lord, we'll do something. That's basically what he's saying. I've, normally I would not do this, Lord, but because you said it, I will do this. But notice what he says. He doesn't say, nevertheless, at thy, this is an interesting wording how Peter says this. Because it's an oxymoron. <laughs> he says, nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the singular. Was that the word Jesus used? And he said, at thy word. Based on what you told me, I will do this. But partial obedience is complete. Every parent has said that before, haven't they? And every child's heard that before, <laughs> right? And that's exactly what Peter does. He says, I'm going to do part of what you said, but not all of what you said. Can I let you in on a little clue, one of the points in the sermon coming up? Disobeying exactly what Jesus said usually ends up costing you something. Right. Okay, let's see what it costs Peter. Simon answered, or he, we already read that, look at verse 6. And when they had done this, what Peter said, they went out, they let down a net. They enclosed a great multitude of fishes. Guess what a draught is? A great multitude of fishes. <laughs> All right? A whole bunch of fish. So much, and their net, singular, break. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, or excuse me, verse 7, I skipped verse 7. They beckoning their partners, which were in an other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both ships, so they began to sink. I don't, I, I personally have never been on that kind of fishing trip. <laughs> I have never had a boat sink down in the water because of the weight of how many fish was in it. That is a good day. <laughs> Amen. That is an incredible day. Two fish, two ships were filled with fish. You know what that's called? A draught. <laughs> Amen. That's a load of fish, a big haul of fish. So Peter, when he got back to land, after they got their boats back filled with fish, so much so they were taking on water, Peter saw it. He fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. That's the right response when you doubt yeah. Jesus. Amen. Anytime you doubt Jesus... Repent. Amen. Amen. Look at Jesus' grace. He says, the reason why Peter and the others, he said, he was astonished at all and, and all that were with him, that the draught of the fishes which they had taken, so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, so it's talking about the other fishermen there. 
And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not. Boy, that's grace, isn't it? From henceforth thou shalt catch men. Peter, I've got a bigger plan for you. That's grace, isn't it? And when they had brought their ships to land, what'd they do? Say it with me. They forsook all and followed him. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Amen? You know, here in this passage, the first thing I want you to look at in verse 1 is faith comes from a desire for God's word. Faith comes from a desire for God's word. Verse 1 tells us that the people pressed on him to hear the word of God. He was there by the lake uh, of the Sea of Galilee, this lake of Gennesaret. And, uh, and he, is, he is pressed on by the people to hear his word spoken. You know, the Bible tells us in, in uh, Romans chapter 10, I want you to turn there. I've quoted it many times, but there's some other verses there I want you to see as well. Go to Romans chapter 10. I want you to see what God's word says there. This is part of the Romans road of salvation. It's the ending part of it. But notice if you would please in verse 17. It says, so, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I've quoted that many times in these messages about being rooted and built up in Christ. See, the word of God gives us the faith to trust in God. And these people wanted to hear the word of God. And, uh, and Peter, Peter was there. He heard the word of God, didn't he? He heard the message, didn't he? It ought to build some faith in him, shouldn't it have? See, the word of God builds faith if we'll listen to what the Word of God has to say. It'll build faith in us. And not only to trust the Lord for salvation, when you're witnessing to somebody, you need to use the Word of God. It's always best if you can show it to them. You know, if you've got your New Testament, show it to them. If you've got your gospel track, open it up and show them the Scriptures. I like gospel tracks that actually have the Scriptures written in them. Not all of them do that, but I like those kind. And so they can read it for themselves. Uh, if, you've got, if you don't have your New Testament. You don't have your, your gospel track. My friend, that's what technology is for. And that's a good time to have a Bible app on your phone. Amen. Because you're always going to have your phone with you. I know how you are. You're always going to have your phone with you. And I have witnessed to somebody on an airplane uh, with my Bible app and shared with them the scripture. And they can read it right there for themselves. Because it's good that they see that it's right there in the scripture. And they can see it for themselves. Because faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. My friend, if you're really going to worship God, you need to be in the book of God. You need to be in the word of God because true worship will build faith in you. And Peter should have had more faith after listening to Jesus preach right there. But I want you to notice something else in this passage of Romans 10. Look back if you would please before verse 17. Beginning in verse 14, it says, it, it, right in verse 13, that's the end of the Romans road of salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm so glad it says whosoever. You know why? Because I can be a whosoever. I may not be a select few, but I can be a whosoever. Praise God for whosoever. Amen. And it says, all I got to do is call. I got to call in faith. I've got to call in believing. I've got to call based on the truth of the word of God. But all I've got to do is call. I don't have to do any rituals. I don't have to do any tricks. I don't have to prove anything. All I've got to do is call in faith to be able to be born again. Aren't you glad for the simplicity of the gospel? Amen. Amen. It says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. See, it's not, it's not, it's not about what you can say with your words. It's about who you believe in your heart. Amen. Amen. We, we don't get into reciting a bunch of uh, doctrinal statements in order to prove your faith. We don't stand up and give testimony about some prophet being a true prophet of God. That's not a statement of faith. Statement of faith for biblical salvation is, I believe who Jesus is. I believe what Jesus came to do. And I believe Jesus did it for me. That's a statement of faith. Amen. See here, it says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But look at verse 14. How then they, shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? That's a good question. Yeah. 
You can't call by faith if you don't believe in him. Right? It's all about faith in Jesus, right? The call of your mouth needs to reflect the belief of your heart. See, it's faith that saves us. The call of our mouth is the echoing of the faith of our heart. What gave us that faith of the heart? The truth of the word of God. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. How can they call on him of whom they have not believed? How can they believe if they have not heard? That's where we come in. See, we're to be speakers of truth. Speakers of the gospel so they can hear. So they can have faith. So they can call. How shall they hear without a preacher? That's not talking about me. That's talking about us. That word is a proclaimer. Amen? It's not talking about a vocational servant of God. It's talking about every child of God. If you have a testimony of salvation, you need to be a proclaimer of that testimony. Amen? Amen? That's what the preacher is. Anybody who's got a testimony ought to be testifying and proclaiming the truth of who Jesus is and what he has done. How shall they preach except they be sent? You know what Jesus did in the Great Commission? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You know what that is? That is the sending. Jesus says in Matthew 18, he says, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye in the same power. Go ye. That's ascending. Every believer has been sent by their Savior to be a proclaimer and a testifier of the truth of who Jesus is and what he's done for them. It says, How shall they preach except they be sent for it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of, feet, of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Are your feet pretty or ugly? Ever thought about that? I've seen some ugly feet. I'm talking literally ugly feet. But this is not what it's talking about here. It's talking about you being obedient to him and his sending of you. How beautiful are your feet? Are you doing what you were here to do? To take the gospel? Look at verse 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. Guess what? They're not all going to obey the gospel. That's just the facts of life. Amen? But that doesn't stop us from going. That doesn't stop us from testifying. Right. Did it stop? Can, can I ask you a question? What if Jesus followed the same logic most Christians do? Here's the logic of most Christians. I know what the Bible says. I know that what God wants me to do. But they aren't going to do it. So why try? That is the logic of most Christians as to why they do not witness they will not believe it, so why try? Can I ask you a question? Aren't you glad Jesus did not follow that logic in coming to earth? Yes. Correct? Did the vast majority of the people on earth when Jesus was here follow him or reject him? Reject him. But if he would have not come to earth, could the ones that did follow him, could follow him? Not at all. So aren't you and I glad he came anyway? Amen. So let's get rid of that excuse and find a better one. While you're working on finding a better one, you might as well just get active obeying because there ain't no better one. Right. And I realize that's terrible grammar. And every teacher in here just cringed. But I got everybody's attention with it, didn't I? There's no better argument, because there's no good argument, to disobey God. That's right. So we just need to get on board with God. 
See, God's children are told to desire God's word. In, in 1 Peter 2, it says, Desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. And God tells us in his word in Proverbs 2, 6, that wisdom comes from the mouth of God. Guess what this book is right here? This is the mouth of God. Amen. Yeah. My friend, we need to get in the book and we need to follow what God says. And God's wisdom comes from God's word. So we need to desire God's word so we can gain God's wisdom, so we can live out God's wisdom. But we've got to desire it. And God tells us to desire it. These people desired it. And we should too. Second point I want you to see is this. Deep faith causes us to use what we have for the Lord. See here we have... Peter, he uses his boat for Jesus to preach. He obeyed Jesus, didn't he? In that matter, Jesus got in the boat and says, Hey, Peter, I need to borrow your boat for a little while so I can preach to all these people. Push me out here. He obeyed. He used what he had for Jesus. You know what? Jesus does not expect you to use what you don't have for him, but he does expect you to use what you do have for him because he's the one that gave it to you. Amen? Amen? It doesn't matter if it's your vehicle. It doesn't matter if it's your house. It doesn't matter if it's your property. It doesn't matter if it's your finances. It doesn't matter if it's your talents. If it doesn't matter if it's your abilities. Whatever you have, you've been given by God, and He expects you to use what you have as a good steward for His glory. Yeah. Amen? Peter, Peter nailed it there. He obeyed. He did exactly what Jesus said. He didn't whine. He didn't complain. He didn't fuss. He didn't cuss. He just did it, right? And you know what? We ought to do the same thing. And I've heard too many Christians fussing and cussing when God tells them to do something. We just need to obey. Peter would have been best if he would have continued that cycle with the next request of Jesus, but he blew it. Let's learn from his mistake and not repeat it, right? See, my friend, I want you to understand something. The Lord's will is not always convenient. You know what I see as the biggest problem in, in our generation right here? Convenience in faith. You know what... God, you know what the end times are going to create even before Jesus comes back? Inconvenience in faith. You know what the vast majority of believers in the vast majority of places of the world are facing today, unlike America? Inconvenience in faith. In fact, persecution in faith. We American Christians are pretty wimpy. If it ain't easy, we ain't doing it. And that's pathetic. Because Jesus did something not easy. Leaving heaven, coming to earth, not easy. Leaving his spiritual condition in heaven and coming in human form, not easy. Living a sinless life in the face of temptation, not easy. Dealing with a bunch of complaining people, not easy. Being falsely accused and taking it, not easy. Being beaten innocently, not easy. Paying a price on a death of a cross that you do not owe, not easy. Aren't you glad he did it? So the next time you feel the Lord wants you to do something and your excuse is not easy, you might want to think about all that. Because that's... Pretty pathetic for what Jesus did for us that was not easy. Amen? See, Peter was cleaning his nets. Throwing them back out in the water, not convenient. <laughs> right? And even interrupting cleaning the net to get in the boat to take Jesus out to preach, not convenient. But he did that, right? See, the Lord... Or excuse me, Peter was tired after fishing all night. And the Lord is interrupting him, cleaning his net so he can go to bed. That's not easy. It's not convenient. But Peter did that. 
See, Peter was willing to be interrupted by the Lord to do his will this time. See, I want to I want to let you in on something. The Lord has a great tendency to interrupt your plans. Yeah. Amen. God can interrupt your plans. Trust me. <laughs> I have had my plans interrupted so many times it's not even funny. The Lord has an interesting way to interrupt your schedule. Right? The Lord really loves interrupting your agenda. Right? The Lord even often interrupts your life. See, follow the Lord's will is not going to be convenient. You might as well plan on it. Right? The Martins following the Lord's will to do the ministry they're doing of pulpit supply and military churches not, not convenient. Asking churches to support them. See, most missionaries, when they get church support, it's constant. It's consistent. Well, we have a couple of churches that do that, but most people do not want to support a missionary that's not on the mission field. And I respect that. So in respect of that, what we ask for is just to support them when they're gone. That makes sense, right? But that's not convenient. Going to Japan, dealing with coronavirus in, in Asia, not convenient. Trying to get out of the country to get your visa stamped to get back into the country, when coronavirus is freaking everybody out in Asia, not convenient. But the Lord's meeting the need, amen? amen? See, God has a way of making things inconvenient. See, the Lord's will is a decision of submission. And that's what we see with Peter here. He submits. We see Peter had to submit himself to the Lord's will. Peter had to submit his plans to the Lord's will. Peter's plan, after fishing all night, let's get these nets clean and get to bed, right? He had to submit that plan to the Lord. Peter had to submit his time to the Lord's will. Lord, I've, I've been up all night. I want to get these nets clean. He could have had all kinds of excuses, but he didn't do that. He just obeyed. He let the Lord be Lord of his time. You know what? If he's Lord, he needs to be Lord of our time. Yeah, right. Amen. And Peter had to submit his tools to the will of the Lord. He had to submit his boat. He had to submit his nets. But he only submitted one. Cost him later, didn't it? See, Peter had to submit in order to obey. And that's the same for all of us. If we're really going to obey the Lord, we've got to submit. You know why he likes to throw us curveballs and, and interrupt our life? To, re, to let us know if he is really Lord. Because he already knows. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. He knows it all, doesn't he? He knows our heart, right? We can say, Lord, Lord, Lord. And he's up there saying, hey, right, right, right. Yeah. Let me throw you one curveball. See how you freak out about it. Right? He knows our heart. There's a story in the Bible about a bunch of people at the final judgment saying, Lord, Lord, we did all this in your name. Lord, Lord, we did all this in your name. Lord, Lord, we did all this. And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. Just because you say Lord does not make him Lord in here. I'm telling you from experience, God likes to throw us curveballs to check for us to be reminded if we are really letting him be Lord. Because a lot of times we say Lord and we're not living Lord. And we can deceive ourselves and the Lord says, let me show you who's really Lord by challenging you this way and see how you handle that. Because when you freak out, 
instead of trust him and obey him, you're not making him Lord. Right. Amen? So Peter made, Lord, made the Lord Lord. He obeyed him. Let us see. The Lord's will usually challenges our faith and obedience. Can I have an amen to that? Amen. When the Lord tells me to do something, it usually involves a challenge. Amen? I enjoyed youth ministry. I'd been doing youth ministry for 12 years. I mean, I was in cruise control in youth ministry. I had a schedule. I had a teaching schedule. I had a ministry schedule. Every once in a while, I threw in, a, threw in something to mix it up and freshen it up. But I had a schedule. I mean, I was there 12 years. I had done this a while. I, I had cruise control. And the Lord says, I'm going to switch things up on you a little bit. A little bit? <laughs> How about a whole bunch? <laughs> I'm going to move you uh, halfway across the country and uh, take you out of youth ministry and put you in pastoral ministry and see how you handle that. Skip your cruise control. <laughs> uh, talk about challenges. <laughs> That's challenging. See, the Lord said to Peter, hey, Peter, good job. Thanks for letting me use your boat. Thanks for just obeying me and not throwing a bunch of excuses up. Thanks for letting me preach to these people so they could all hear it from the water there. That was really cool. Thanks a lot. Now I got something else for you. Why don't you go back out there with all your nets and fill them up with some fish? Peter would have been better off with plan A like he did the first time. Lord, you got it. No problem. Let's, hey, guys, let's get all the nets. Let's get all the boats. Let's get out there. The Lord said we're going to get a bunch of fish. We might as well be prepared. But he didn't handle it that way, did he? First time, he did great. Sure, Lord, no problem. <laughs> he didn't say, I've been up all night. He didn't say, I want to go to bed. He didn't say, blah, 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 blah. He, he just said, yeah, sure, Lord, no problem. But this time, he's like, Lord, come on. We've been fishing all night. There's nothing out there biting. There's nothing out there to catch in the nets. They're, they're in another part of the lake. It's a big lake. I'm, we've, we're tired of trying to find them. We want to go to bed. However, because you said it, I'll do a little bit. See, Jesus spoke his will to Peter after preaching his word. You know, often... When God speaks to your heart, it's after listening to his word. Either in corporate worship like this or in personal worship alone with God. Rarely have I had God speak to me apart from reading this book or being in this book. I, it has happened a few times. But the most consequential decisions I've ever made in my life was God speaking to me after spending time in his word. When I got saved, it was after the preaching of his word. When I got my heart right with God after being away from the Lord, it was after preaching, after the preaching service of God's word. When I decided God's will was for us to come out here, it was after my personal worship time in the word. See, Jesus has just got done preaching the word. Peter had to hear it. He was in the boat with him. Talk about up close and personal. He had the best seat in the house. However, he didn't fully obey the Lord. See, Jesus' will for Peter did not make sense to Peter. And that's where we all struggle. When it doesn't make sense to us, we struggle. When it's not logical to us, we struggle. And we struggle with that with other people too. Have you ever been having a conversation with somebody and you're not tracking with them? And you're struggling with, what in the world are they talking about, right? Yeah. We had this happen in our house. We were having a conversation. My mind was going one way. My wife's mind was going the other way. And she's like, how did you get that out of that? And I was like, how did you get that out of that? <laughs> right? <laughs> That's the way we are, right? And when, when the Lord does not always make sense to us, right? Because his ways are above our ways, correct? Yeah. We've got to let him be God, because we're not. Amen. Amen. Amen? 
See, launching out in the deep after fishing, good fishing time was done, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Going fishing again after you've been fishing and you had not caught anything doesn't make sense. Getting your nets messed up after you clean them does not make sense. Yeah. Not going to bed when you've been up all night does not make sense. Right? See, Jesus' word and will is his promise to be trusted, not doubted. It's all about faith. See, Peter had a faith, faith crisis. We got a lot of Christians with a faith crisis right now. And I'm not, I'm not downplaying the virus or anything like that, but it's not bigger than God. And, I, you know, wash your hands. You know, I was listening to a news, a news conference I, I laughed when the fifth person stood at the microphone and said the exact same thing. Every one of them said, wash your hands. If you're sick, stay home. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, and people are still freaking out. <laughs> right? I may get sick, but I'm just going to trust the Lord anyway. But I'm not going to be foolish. But I'm not going to panic. Amen. See, Jesus told Peter, Peter, if you go out with all your nets, with all your boats, you'll get a bunch of fish. Basically, I was going to say, he didn't give them all those details. He just said, launch out in the deep, let down your nets for a drought. That's a promise. The connection is, you do this, it'll happen. The Bible is full of those statements. If you do this, this will happen. Yeah. If you give, he'll give. Right? Yeah. That's what the Bible says. But we limit God's blessing by our disobedience. Yeah. I want you to see something else here. See, Jesus, is, Jesus promised success based on obedience. He said, I promise you a draught, but you're going to miss part of the draught if you don't obey. Yeah. Our success is based on obedience. Our blessing from God is based on obedience. Our salvation is blessed on obeying the gospel. Whosoever shall call shall be saved. Therefore, if you don't call, you won't be saved. If you don't call in faith, you won't be saved. It, there, there's, there's blessing to obedience. But disobedience, there's consequences. Yeah. See, Peter's experience of the Lord's will was based on his own obedience. See, Peter could have refused and disobeyed and missed out completely. He didn't do that, did he? Peter could have obeyed completely and experienced more. He could have done that, right? Yeah. Peter ultimately obeyed partially and experienced Greater struggles and less potential than he could have because of his partial disobedience. See, Jesus often challenges our will. He challenges us to acknowledge who all that we have belongs to. And guess what? The sooner you acknowledge everything you have belongs to him, the better off you're going to be. And the more blessings you will receive by obeying him with all that you have. Do we see our things as our things or his things trusted to us? Do we see our things as his blessing on our life? Do we see all that we are and have as being offered to him and his will and his glory? That's the way it ought to be, but we don't always do that. See, the Lord challenges us to acknowledge who we belong to personally. Peter, if I'm Lord, do what I say. Okay, Lord, I'll do part of what you say. Is he really Lord then? We got to ask ourselves that. Peter found out who's Lord here. Peter was. Why do you think he's on his knees before Jesus asking for forgiveness? Because the Lord wasn't the Lord. Peter was. See, do we truly belong to him? Do we really believe that? 
D does our life really belong to him? Does our time really belong to him? Does our talent honestly belong to him? Does our treasure completely belong to him? Do we honestly believe that he is the giver of all things to us and we're just merely stewards of them? Do we really believe that or do we just say it? See, the Lord has a way to help us see the truth in what we say or the lack of truth in what we say. We need to put our faith into practice. Even in the face of coronavirus, we need to put our faith into practice. Amen. And trust him over everything. Deep faith always helps us experience life better. Now, I'm, not, I'm not throwing you out your best life now stuff, all right? I'm just telling you the facts. Trust the Lord, you're going to live life better than not trusting the Lord. Right. Amen? See, here we see in the last portion of this scripture, Jesus kept his promise. Listen, listen. Jesus kept his promise even though Peter did not fully obey. Did he not? Did they have a whole bunch of fish? So much that they ripped their nets, right? Let me ask you a question. If you're fishing with a net and the net rips, what's going to happen to the fish? Some of them are going to go out the hole, right? So I guarantee you they lost some fish. Now, I, they got a lot. But they could have had more if they had just obeyed. See, our experience of life is based on our obedience and faith in God's promises. They did go out. They did go out in the deep. They trust the Lord that much. They did drop a net. But they didn't drop all the nets. They did get a great haul of fish. Just like Jesus said they would. But they did not experience all of those fish coming into their boats. They missed out on some of them. Don't know how many, but they missed out on some of them. See, our lack of faith always ends up costing us needlessly. You know what cost Peter? Not just the fish he missed that he didn't get paid for. He could have made a whole lot more money if he had just obeyed the Lord. Guess what else he missed out on? He missed out on more sleep. Yeah. Correct? Because of not obeying God and letting down all the nets... And then cleaning all the nets again. He now had to clean all the other nets. Because the other guys came out there. Right? And they still had to clean them. Now they had to. What class? They had to mend them too. He would have saved himself more time. He would have got more sleep. And he would have got more pay. If he had just obeyed God completely. Instead of partially. And the same thing is true for you and me. We will get more blessings. We'll experience better life. If we obey completely. Instead of partially. We limit God's blessing in our lives. By our disobedience and lack of faith. And that's exactly what it was. It was a lack of faith. That caused Peter to limit God's blessing in his life. And the same thing is true for us. Peter wasted time and money and emotional embarrassment because he had to admit he was wrong every guy here knows that's the worst thing in the world for a guy to have to do right we hate that more than anything we hate that right that's why we usually don't admit it because we hate it so much I'm kind of glad Peter was willing to admit it he could have saved him Humbled pie and eaten crow if he had just obeyed the Lord the first time. Amen. But aren't you glad he did humble himself and repent to the Lord? Oh, amen. He did fall down at Jesus' feet. He did admit he was a sinner. He did confess his sins. See, he was astonished by what he knew, knew about the Lord. He learned something new about the Lord here. And you know what? Every time we trust the Lord, we're going to learn something new. But guess what? Every time we disobey the Lord, we're going to learn something new too. Like he was right and we were wrong. And I'm sure glad he's willing to forgive me because I blew it big time. See, deep faith is something we grow in. 
to follow Jesus more. And that's exactly what we see all of these men do. They get back to the land and they follow Jesus. They forsake everything and follow Jesus. They experienced, this experience caused them to trust Jesus more. They experienced his power to bless them miraculously. They experienced his promise to be fulfilled in his word completely, what Jesus says he will do. They experienced his grace to receive their repentance fully. And they experienced his mercy in the fact that he didn't give up on them. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Jesus didn't say, hey, I'm done with you guys. I'm going to go find some people that obey me. Aren't you glad Jesus doesn't do that? Aren't you glad Jesus is full of grace and mercy? Amen. Jesus said, hey, Peter, I forgive you, and I've got better things for you. You're going to catch some men with me now. I just hope you trust me a little more. <laughs> Amen. See, this, this acknowledgement of sin caused them to follow Jesus more. They learned to follow Jesus more fully by not following him fully this time. I guarantee you next time they thought a little more about it, right? We need to learn from our experiences of failure so we obey better next time. They forsook all based on Jesus' invitation. They didn't take all the nets before, but now they're forsaking all the nets to follow Jesus. I think they learned a few things, don't you? See, they followed Jesus based on the faith they had grown in because of this experience. They kept on following Jesus because they kept on experiencing more of him in their lives. And that's what Jesus wants for us. He wants us to experience more of who he is so we will trust him more as we grow. We need to grow in this matter. And deep faith helps us to grow. See, this growth in faith caused them to utilize, to be utilized, excuse me, in Jesus' will more. And they were. These men, these men right here, Peter, James, and John, these men were the beginning of the disciples. The disciples were the beginning of the church. The disciples were the apostles that were the recorders of the New Testament. I'm kind of thinking they were utilized pretty effectively by Jesus. You and I limit how Jesus can utilize us by our lack of faith. But if we will learn and grow through our experiences, we can be utilized more if we'll trust him more. Let's pray.